I'm just reading the chat now. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, uh, today we're going to be starting uh, topic 12, right? Topic 12, um, statistical distributions. Um, and then tomorrow, not tomorrow, Friday will be kind of like central limit theorem um, and like central tendency and stuff like this. Um, so the idea here is like for phase two, we're really focusing on statistics um, and that will lead us to eventually with statistical distributions to lead us into hypothesis testing, uh, which includes like A-B testing and all that stuff. And then from there, we'll kind of move a little bit into Bayes' theorem and then into uh, linear regression, which will be our first, like I call it, our first real machine learning algorithm. Though even then some people don't count it as machine learning. So we'll see how it goes. Um, all right, so let me go start sharing my screen and we'll get started on statistical distribution. Oh wait, I actually am not gonna do statistical distributions first. I am going to do summary statistics. So this is some stuff that we actually would have gone through already in like phase one, but I think it's helpful to just remind a few things because we didn't explicitly talk about any study group. So that this might be a little blast from the past, but it's definitely very important and completely relevant. So um, central tendency. So what we're going to do here, um, I think I actually showed you all about this data source, uh, data, data source set, which is, here we go. My internet's slow. You guys see that loading? Okay. We talked about Ascom's quartet, and then we talked about like how we have this whole um, this data set right here. And these this these are different data points, obviously, having different patterns. We talked about this in during visualization, but you can actually notice um, if you go through this, I think there's a, there's a little animation here. You can see that averages, the standard deviations, correlations are actually very similar to each other. Um, and they can the paper actually talks about how they can find values that are pretty close and actually find different graphs. And and my internet's a little slow right now, so deal with it. But um, these all have very similar standard deviations on the X and Y, uh, similar means, and also the same correlation. So these are kind of one of the things like, you know, summary statistics is exactly that. It is a summary. It does not mean the complete description of your data set, right? And so one thing we talked about is like using, you know, visualizations to actually show this, but we always want to be aware that we are summarizing and we're getting a picture of the data itself, right? And it's not that that's not useful. It's just that we have to know the limitations of what we're doing, okay? So with that note, uh, let's check out some data that I kind of just made up right here. So this one is going to be this retirement age. And so basically each of these um, points are basically the age someone retired at. Um, it's a very, very small data set. And you can see I made a little histogram here and you can see if we can get a view of this picture. So just looking at this picture, like what are some things that we notice immediately? Obviously this is fake data. It's um, relatively small, but what are some things that we can already tell? Skewed. It's skewed and skewed in what direction? Like um, uh, left or right. right. Yeah, so there's definitely like a bulk coming over here, but there's also like this bulk at 54, right? There's definitely a lot of 54 year old-ish age. And then we also have it kind of bring out around here. So like, okay, there seems to be a little bit of separation between the most common age and then like kind of like the general like overall population, okay? So like, I want you guys to just kind of consider this, like, you know, like how will you describe this? You know, like there's a bunch of things that come out from this. So like, we're gonna talk about mean and median, um, but really picturing like, you know, the mean and median does not tell us the whole picture, right? So remember, we're just doing a summary here, but it's very useful. So in this case, we take the mean. Mean, anyone take a guess like where that mean might be? Like around what numbers? It's probably gonna be like a decimal, but I guess. Closer to 56. 55, yeah, 56, maybe around 56. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, kind of like right around here. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so let's see here. Yeah, 56.4, so it's about right. And you can see that's probably because it's leaning towards one direction the over uh, versus another direction. If I, for example, took rid of all these 54 people, or at least a lot of 54 people, like our, our mean is going to change, right? In fact, if I get rid of more 54 people, see, now we have a different data set. It's going to start moving over. So that those, those people who are 54 are really bringing it over to the left. Like without them, we get something closer to like 57 and a half versus like when we did have them, it was like 56 and a half. Okay, so cool. Oops. I had a quick question. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the way that uh, a histogram normally is, can you call that bimodal? Because there does seem to be like, there is a mode for the later on where there's, there is two humps. Like what would you call something with like multiple humps? Yeah, you might describe this as bimodal. Like obviously it's a very small data set. So it's kind of tough to like really like 
say something very large about this because you could probably look at the numbers themselves and see pretty quickly like you know what we're going to talk about different ways to plot these and distributions um but i would probably describe this as five models like we really have like a big spike at 54 and then kind of like where we'd expect like if this data was gone like we'd have something about 57 and a half right here right um, so that's everything that's not 54. so you can kind of imagine that there's different um different modes here which mode being like what's the most common value so yeah but i would say like for a small data set like this, you probably just like, oh, there's a lot of 54 year olds. And then the average around like 57 and a half if we exclude those. So yeah, anyway, I just wanted to show a little bit. Um, you can calculate your mean from NumPy, right? So np.mean, really easy. Um, if we didn't know how to write our mean here, I'm not going to go through this. This is usually if we do this oh, back into phase one. Um, but you could basically just take, OK, how many, val like adding up all the values together and dividing it by how many values. So I can essentially just do like, you know, return sum of x. Remember, x is like an array, so I can do this and divide by the length of x, right? And that would give me my mean. So if I do this now, um, we'll say x, you get the same average. OK, cool. Pretty easy stuff. Just kind of remember that this is how we do our average here, uh, our median, or sorry, our mean and average. OK, median. So median, um, if you don't know what median really is, basically, you can think of it as half the data is on the left, half the data is on the right. So our median in this case is 57. And so if you look at this right here, our mean is actually in yellow, our, uh, or sorry, our mean is actually in red and our median is in yellow. So you can see here is that we actually see that that median is sitting at right there and the mean is getting pulled off to the left, getting basically skewed over, being pulled off away from the median. If you have something that's um, more evenly distributed, which we'll talk about more like in the normal distribution, but as it's evenly more distributed, you'd expect the mean and median to be closer together. The more extreme these values are over here, the more that, me, um, that uh, mean is going to be pulled in that direction. So just to kind of show an example of this, if um, I have X mean, X median, let's do X plus, let's say someone retires like at 70. We can see here is that it gets kind of pulled over in this direction. If I do like some really big values, I think I can get the mean like really far off. I can't even see now, <laughs> but you can get that mean just, for, oh, you know what? That means not going to change because I'm actually just adding these values on here. So what I was trying to get at was like that 70 and let's just do NP dot um, mean of X plus 70. So I'm just adding 70 to the list here. Oops, I ended with a few. There we go. And you can see now, you can't see it as easily, but you can see the reds actually on the right side. And so we say that the, the median is more robust than the mean. And robust mean that it's just not being affected as much by outliers. So you can imagine the 70 years old is outliers. And our median, if I actually calculated, let's say our median right here, just, I just add 70. You can see the median doesn't really change that much. In fact, it's exactly the same in this case. So that's why we talk about the median being more robust. And so this is actually a really great tool to actually look at not just the mean. In fact, a lot of times we'll look at the median because it just doesn't get changed as um, easily by the, um, by outliers. So, oh, I actually did this. Past picture is smart, 120 years old. And you can see here the mean from before and afterwards, in this case with 120, which is very, very like large, like one value, right? Has changed the average by almost like three points, by three years versus the median. Obviously doesn't change at all because still half of it's still left, half of it's to the right. Okay. So yeah, I just want to show that demonstration there. Sound pretty good? Any questions? Okay. Hopefully this sounds pretty familiar. Nothing too new. All right. Dispersion. So this basically talking about like the spread of like our data itself. So we want to see like how much these values differ from each other and how would you measure that, right? So you can kind of think about some ways you could do this. Um, one is that you can say, okay, like, like taking some like structural point and counting how far away each point is, which essentially is what we do with the variance, where basically say, oh, here's the mean, how far is each point away from the mean? And that's what we get like variance. And the thing about that though, what would be the issue about using just like, you know, how far away it is from um, the mean? Like if we look at every point and look at like how far away it is. So one thing, go ahead. Peter. Pluses and minuses. Yeah, so if you consider like negative right, values and positive values, well, if they're both evenly distributed, your values are going to be close to zero. Basically, you have all the negatives and all the, the positives are going to cancel out each other. Um, one way to circumvent this is to use absolute value, 
which is something actually we do use, but it's not used in variance, and there's a few reasons why. Um, but that would basically have the more absolute values, like, okay, just positive values. Um, that does have an effect, though, because you now are, um, you don't punish very large values. So if you have something that's very, very spread out because there's some really extreme values, um, it won't be as affected as much if you square the value, which is actually what we'll do with variance and standard deviation. So the reason why we'll actually square it is partly just to um, make it a positive value. So you can see like this is the point right here, minus the mean x bar squared is just like, okay, like making a positive value, but also there's another benefit where really extreme values get emphasized in the standard deviation. So that's what's going on here. And I should say not standard deviation, but the variance is um, sigma squared. So good. that's exactly what we're doing right here. Thanks for going cancel it. Um, again, there's one strategy is what we're doing here. It's called LT, L2 norm. So that's essentially what we're doing for this thing, the L2 um, norm of this. And then L1 norm is actually using absolute value. Um, so sometimes you'll see it's like LAD or LAA. So, but generally when we're talking about standard deviation, we're usually talking about the L2 norm. Okay, so I have some code here. You can see a little bit like what this would look like. For example, I have that list of numbers. I have the average, kind of the average right there. And then this variance right here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sum up, right? Sum up all those values where we have each value of Xn. So Xn in X, it's so basically taking out each value in X in that list, taking that value, subtracting off the average, which is the same every single time, and then squaring it, okay? And we have this big old list of basically like these distances from the mean squared. And then we divide the whole thing by the number of lists, which is divided by one over N. So that actually returns the variance. So you can see here, if I do this variance, you can see 4.25. So that basically means like, you know, if we can tell the that like, oh, like there's a distance of five or 4.25 um, is basically describing our spread. If our data is more spread out, this value would be larger. Okay, sound pretty good. All right, cool. So there's a lot going on there, but it's the whole thing that we can do. So this right here, this is, I'm actually gonna, um, let's see here. Oh, uh, so let's see here. Visualizing, we have histograms, box plots, violin plots. So we've seen histograms a lot. I think some people even use box plots. Has anyone heard of a violin plot or used a violin plot? That's yeah, kind of fun stuff. Um, so I'm going to show you the data three times. So one is going to be a box or um, histogram. So this is the data with um, the different ages. You can see the different ages here. This right here is actually a box plot, right? So we know familiar with box plots. You can see here the median is actually highlighted in red. And you can see right here, this is going to be our inner quartile range, basically where like 75%, sorry, not 75%, 50% of the values are within that box area. And you can actually adjust your box plots into different ways, which is kind of cool. But the idea here is that 25% of the values are within this first section, 25% are in this section. And then we have also our um, outlier, essentially that extra section. Okay. A violin plot is very similar to a box plot, but it's kind of like a histogram and a box plot put together. So this isn't like the best picture of this, but you can see a little bit of like, it's more of an organic shape that's representing the, the distribution of these values. So you see like almost like um, safe said about bimodal, you can see these like two little humps right here. Okay. Cool. So these are like three things you can use to actually plot out these values. Um, if I throw in an outlier, you can see a little bit what that looks like. So you can see here uh, with the box plot that by default, you can see an outlier. You can see um, the violin plot does something similar where you have the outlier. You can imagine that box plot being turned on its side. Um, is that this is the outlier right here, and it's trying to make a more of organic shape. Um, note that the, basically this little hump becomes one hump because this value is so far off that basically those two humps that we would have seen right here, this kind of comes into like just essentially one big hump. Okay. Cool. Right. Any questions on that? This is another way to uh, show this. So um, these are things that you can use like in the future for like your plot and stuff like that. And then finally, we got covariance and correlation. So the idea of like covariance correlation is that we're relating it with other variables. Uh, we'll see a lot more of this in linear regression, which is at the end of this phase. But covariance is basically the variance between two variables. So you can see here, instead of having you know x minus the average squared, we actually have x minus the average of x of all the x's times y minus the average of all the y's. So the idea here is if you have like an x y coordinate. So imagine if you had a data frame and you had the next column, a y column, the xi and the yi would be that on that same row. Okay, and this basically tells us, similar to like variance, it's telling us how closely related these uh, values are with each other. I'm not the notation right here. This is the covariance of x and y. So sigma x y. No, there's no square because it's a little x and y there. Basically describing that there's two variables being described together. Cool. Um, 
correlation. There's this funky stuff right here, um, but there's a whole bunch of ways we can measure correlation. Um, the most common one is Pearson's correlation. So we usually use, use lowercase r for this. And if you look at this, it looks very, it could look very intimidating, but if you look closely, it's actually not too bad. This one right here, if you look at this part, that's really just showing um, the variance among x. And this is the variance among y. Multiply those together, taking the square root, and then um, we're dividing the covariance of x and y by these variances squared, uh, variances multiplied together and then taking the square root. And this always gives us a value now between basically minus one and uh, one, I'm sorry, not five, zero and one. So it can be very, very small. Um, zero meaning that there's like almost no correlation and one being that basically they're perfectly correlated with each other. Okay, cool. All right, how are we feeling on this? Excuse me, I'm about to sneeze for a second. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so that's some really quick basics. Um, hopefully, you're pretty familiar with mean, median, um, standard deviation already, but it kind of helps to kind of go over it, like what those look like. All right, versus like sometimes just a value that gets spit out. So that leads us to really section 12, which um, we're going to see how well we do here. Um, but you know, this, just for the record, we might not complete the whole thing, um, but that's okay. Um, there's a lot to go through. So I'm just going to import some of these libraries here. Specifically, uh, this is probably the newest library that you haven't seen before is SciPy Stats. So we'll use SciPy a little bit. Um, and SciPy is really useful for doing a lot of numerical calculations. Um, Scientific Python, that's kind of what the name from. And note that we're using stats. And we're actually going to use some skew normal. That's just for me to show a few things off. So one thing I want to talk about is randomness. So to keep things random, when we say something like random in a computer, it's not actually true. Like we actually are technically doing pseudo randomness. And when we say pseudo random, basically it means like it's like a random number, but it really isn't. And that's partly because computers have to be deterministic. Um, there are some really interesting ways people can get truly, like, well, I don't know if truly random is a real thing necessarily, but random away from like pseudo randomness. Um, things are like looking at like Geiger counters of like particle dis decaying. Um, there's a company that uses uh, lava lamps and the motion of the lava lamps helps basically produce like new random numbers and stuff like that. The idea there is that it's so complicated that it looks random. And that's the idea of like really, let me say a random number on a computer. It's so complicated enough that you really can't like reverse back to it. Um, so here I showed a couple pictures of like, you know, get a random number, return four. It's like, you know, if you got a four from a random gener number generator, would you know it's actually random? I mean, you don't really know, right? Like until you like you maybe try it multiple times. Um, same thing like right here in this little um, thing, a random number generator where it gives nine, 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 nine. Very, very unlo unlikely, but like technically it could be random and it'd be perfectly fine. So randomness can be a very weird thing for us as humans to get because we just don't have, it's when we see, we like to see patterns and sometimes those patterns just happen to randomness. Um, in fact, one thing that you can use for fraud detection is to see if someone's trying to be extra random versus like, like if we see any patterns in randomness, we think that's like not random, but in reality, if it is truly random, you will expect patterns over time. So some interesting areas, but far important part is that we have this NumPy, we can actually produce random numbers. We have to pass in a seed. And what that seed does now is that when I run these guys, so you can see here, I have eight, six, two, um, sorry, eight, six, two, nine, eight, nine, three, eight, eight, eight. This is just basically producing five random numbers between one and 10, okay? Um, if I have to redo this over and over again, so I'm going to show you like on this guy right here, I can do this over and over. Oops. Sorry, <laughs> I'm on a different computer today, so I'm throwing me off. What's the shortcut? On, what's the shortcut on Mac to run the same cell without moving down? Command, okay. Command enter. So you can see here I'm getting new random numbers every single time. Now, if I go ahead and, and let's say uh, restart this, kernel restart. And I won't get rid of the output. So this should be completely new, right? Now, if this were truly random, you won't expect the same thing. But because I have this seed, basically this is a starting off point. So if I run this now, okay. Now I'm not going to rerun these two, but these were the first two results I got. If I run this one, this uh, this will actually produce the same exact values. And you can see here that's eight six two nine eight. And if I run this, you should get nine three eight eight eight. Okay. And that's because they're not actually random. What we're having is like saying, oh, reproduce the same thing starting from this point. That's pseudo random. So it's still determined, but we can say it's close enough to random. Um, you'll see people use this a lot in data science because it basically allows us to make sure that we're not like 
randomly seeing better results just because we chose, you know, just by chance. The idea here is that you're keeping it consistent every single time. So you're not going to kind of keep like running it over and over again until you get a good result. Um, so this is pretty consistent where you actually feed in the seed. Okay. Does that make sense to people? Hey, uh, Victor, mm -hmm. quick question on the seed. Does it matter what number you put in? Can you just put any number? Yeah, you can put whatever you want. So, All right. yeah, you'll see a lot of people put like 42. If anyone knows like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, like that's a very typical one people will put in there. Uh, people have their favorite number in there. Um, I'll put in my favorite number and just like kind of throw in like so the same thing. Um, in reality, it doesn't really matter. Um, but like the wrong way to do this, like um, is to change the seed until you get a good result. That's not a good idea. Because um, that's basically just trying to pick out like good results. Um, so I'd say like, just stick with a number and then ignore it the whole time when you're doing your code. Cool. So I don't think I have to rely on that. So I'm just gonna keep it the way it is. All right, cool. So now that we talked about randomness, we can actually talk about distributions. So what's really cool about distribution, we'll talk about the normal distribution, which is like the holy grail of all distributions. Like that's what we like because um, there's some really great parametric stuff we can do. But the cool thing is that we actually need to find something new, which is our average sigma, which is going to be a uh, standard deviation. So in this case, I like have 14, 2.8. And then I say, OK, give me 5,000 points. That's what the n is. And I can actually just uh, create a distribution called uh, a random or a normal distribution or a Gaussian and just pass in values uh, the average, the standard deviation, and how many points I have. And what I did get there, I actually get a distribution like this and actually get a list of numbers. In fact, if we do. Well, you can see a little bit like these values right here. And if you look at um, if you look at these values, you would see that they're actually normally distributed, which means like they have a certain pattern to them. Um, they're still technically random, but they're random based around a certain distribution, a way that we sample out this information from here. So um, that's here. So if I want to show, I think I kind of skipped over this part right here. I just want to make sure. So to actually plot out this distribution, I can go ahead and show you this guy here. And you can see here, these are the values themselves and this is a histogram. And you can see it's got a very nice pattern right here. So note that if it was completely random, right, I would expect this not to have this shape. Does that make sense? Like there's definitely a preference towards this middle right here. And you can see I highlighted the average that we passed in, which was 14 right here. And you see it's pretty close to like what you think of what the average is. Um, note that also I have mu sigma, mu minus sigma in green here. That basically say one standard deviation from the mean, one standard deviation to the left, one standard deviation to the right. And we actually will find that in a Gaussian in a normal distribution, we'll find about 68% of all values within this part. And what's cool is that we can actually say those things, um, we can actually say those things about this distribution, which is why we love using it because it's nice mathematics that we can actually play around with. Okay. Now, just to kind of like, I think you guys can believe me, like, do you guys know what would this would look like if I had a random distribution? It'd just be a nice block. Right, given kind of get why that would be true. That makes sense to people. Okay, yeah. So like, note that if I had this on random, so let's for example, I just do random int, just to just to prove a point. So I think that kind of helps. So sometimes you can look at a distribution, and see immediately what that's supposed to be. Uh, random int. And let's see here. We want to do let's say uh, between zero and ten, and then we're just going to have n points. So if I do this now, no, that I'm just rewriting over dist. Uh, if I plot that guy out, you see here it's closer to th this is still getting plotted out. So I can get rid of this guy. And you can see here it's closer to a random distribution right here where these are integers, right? So I have like some spikes going on here. But you can see basically it's a flat curve. Okay. Make sense to everyone? Okay. So What's cool is that if we see this right here, a very similar pattern, we can actually turn it back to the clock and say, hey, this data looks normal. We can pretend we can actually write out the equation for a normal distribution. So to an example of like what this might look like, I have this data set, California housing test. You can see here's some of the data right here. I'm actually gonna pull specifically the housing median age, which is right here. So I'm gonna pull out that data right here. You can see there's 3000. You can see the standard deviation. Um, you see the minimum, the maximum, right? And we also see the mean. So also note that it's 50%. That is actually the median. So that's not what that 50% means. Um, so I can actually run this right here and actually build up. I think what would be the average uh, from here? The average is 28.8. This is reading this off here. And the uh, standard deviation is 12.5. Uh, so if I actually take this distribution, what this will look like looks like this. Okay. And then if I actually took this guy, 
So like this is what the data actually look like. And let's say I have mu and sigma. And this time I actually take this guy here. So what I'm doing here is like, this is the actual data, what it looks like. And I'm taking the average in the same deviation. If I feed this into a distribution, what would that normal distribution look like? And this normal distribution does not look the way I expected to. Oh, it's about green wrong. Okay, so you can see here, it's like, this is the actual, like, like this would be the, the perfect normal distribution. Well, it's not perfect because it's randomized. Like I'm actually producing it. We see that this would be roughly normal. And you can see like, oh, it's kind of similar, but there's definitely some interesting stuff going on here. Um, the whole point when we do hypothesis testing is basically taking this data and saying, is it gonna be like a, um, a normal distribution? So that's kind of like my motivation of like what we're moving forward to. Okay. All right, so hopefully you guys see a little bit like how we can pull information here to build something that's like normal, even if it's not close, even if it's not exactly right. All right, so now we get to go into all the fun stuff that actual describing distributions like that. So we have a few ways to describe the same information and it can be really helpful for us. So one is a PMF called a probability mass function. And the way I like to think about it is like, the reason why it's called mass function is like, imagine like the mass is hanging on the, like a bar. Um, you can think of a PMF as very similar to a histogram. So here's a visualization um, that I produced earlier. And basically this would be a classic PMF graph um, where we essentially have, in this case, it's just like integers. So these are the actual values going here, 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 here. And this is basically on this guy right here. And so think how many counts there are, this is the relative frequency amongst all the times. So like this value comes up about, you know, uh, about like point, you know, one, two. So it's about 12, 12 and a half percent of the time, 12 and a half percent here. So like a little bit, like maybe 22% of the time. And so this basically gives us an idea of how often this occurs. So again, very similar to a histogram. The difference being that you are describing the frequency versus like the actual counts. Okay. So any questions on that? Okay. So let's do some code on this stuff. So I'm basically pulling up some collections so I can make some stuff. I'm going to make a random roll of dice. I'm just going to basically uh, between one and seven. So like one, two, three, four, five, six, do this 3000 times. I'm going to do that twice. I have two different die rolls and then add them up together and then see the distribution of two die rolls together. Okay. So first of all, you should probably know is that what's the smallest number I can have for this sum of dice? Two. Two, right? You can only get one, like the smallest you can get is one and one, which means two. And what's the largest one? It's going to be six and six, 12, right? So we can already see a little bit. Uh, note that this right here is what we call uniformly distributed, meaning that there's a uniform distribution of randomness. Basically, every number is equal to each other, um, or just as likely. But the sum of dice will definitely have some, if you ever you know, played any board game, right? You know snake eyes is not as common as like seven. So that's what we'll see here. So what we want to do is actually take these values and the sum of dice and actually count out like what, how many often do these values occur. So we can actually do this with collections. Um, this is a collections library from right here. We can actually count out how many values that actually occur in here. And if I do this, you can actually see, I do this for actually both the dice and then also the sum of those dice. You can see here that seven occurs 536 times, six occurs 427 times, and so on, so on. We can go all the way to the top right. In fact, you can see on here is two occurs the least number of times, only 80 times, which is what we'd expect it to be. Okay. So I can plot this out now of this PMF. So this right here is like, what's going on? This seems like a lot of code going on here. And what we're doing here, essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna plot out each part and we're just gonna basically pull out each value of K in this plot range. And so I'm gonna pull out, you know, like, oh, you can plot a two, you can plot a three, plot a four, and then get the value divided by the, how many times that roll, like how many rolls we did in total. In this case, the total rolls we did was I think 3000. So just basically just giving us our frequency and plotting that out. And I plot this out for each one. So I got all these values in here. So these are all percents. So if, just to show you a little bit, if I do PMF sum, you can see here, this is representing two. This is three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 15. Oh, <laughs> this is 12. This is one. Why is one zero? Possible to get a one, right? You can't do it. So that's why um, I'm going from all the plot range. So if I plot this out now, you can see here, this is die number one. And you can see here about randomly, you know, about evenly done. Die number two, similarly evenly, right? And then if I do uh, for the sun dice, you can see here, oh, look, this nice little normal distribution. And you can see the most common value is what? Seven, right? And you can see here, I did two different PMFs, right? There's PMF that we had like kind of like the uh, 
graph I showed you, and then what looks like a histogram right here. So now that this is a histogram, and this is right here is technically the PMF. Um, now that to plot this, we can actually use this plot.stem. Okay, cool. So just know that the, um, the similarities between these two is um, they're basically showing the same relative like um, like height and value, but the difference is the PMF, we call it a probability mass function when we're talking about the frequency. So you can see here's the frequency versus like the counts, which is what plots by histogram we're talking about, how many counts there are. Make sense? Cool. Any questions or comments? On the histogram, some why is 12 the same level as, I guess, 11? Yeah, I think that's actually because I stopped it early. Okay. So this is actually counting it both. So if I think if I do this, there we go. We get something a little closer to what we were doing. I'm not sure okay. this is such a, so much higher. This, I'm a little, oh, it's probably because, you know what, also too, is that I'm having it also calculate the bins for me automatically. So I could specify how many bins I actually want, and then it would actually put it, you know, into Got a it. specific spot. Yeah. So it, it, this one's counting, obviously, something more than once, like probably seven and like six together, or at least some level. Um, when I had it originally like this, it's probably counting part of 11 as 12, or 12 and 11 together, which is why you see that extra bump which I think that makes sense. If you see, if I add these up together, you probably see a bump up to be a little bit past 10. Yeah, yeah good catch though. This is why it's important to like know what bins make sense. All right, so the next distribution function is called a CDF, a cumulative distribution function. I think most people feel pretty comfortable with this. I think this is like what you classically see in school and stuff like this. Um, CDF I think is a little bit more difficult to wrap your head around, but it's actually really, really useful. So the function here, and I'm going to show you the function and say, what does this mean? The function f of x, um, capital f of x, is basically describing um, uh, CD, like this is the CDF itself, is that effect. And basically, it's saying how p, the probability, or you get the measure of the counts, that this x occurs for less than or equal to lowercase x. So what that means is that we're basically counting the value at like 10 um, would be saying all, all the counts that 10 happens, 9 happens, Eight happens, seven happens, six, five, four, three, two, one. So it's counting everything cumulatively. Okay. And what's nice is that there's actually a really easy way to do this is instead of like, you know, you can imagine you have a list of values. Instead of like trying to like create this stuff, you can actually use cumsum, which is actually a vectorized uh, form on NumPy. So you can actually do this really quickly. And you can see here, there we get our, uh, our full distribution or our, our CDF here. And you can see here, I have it go through one through 13. I'm only using one die here. Oops. Oh, I know I did one through 13. It's because I have this die goes all the way to 0, 1, 2, all the way to 12. But you can see here's like, okay, like you can see after uh, six, it's just 100%, like including everything, which makes sense. Like you can only roll a die up to six. So 10 is included in there because like you could anything that's above 10 or above six is going to be included. So you can see this kind of goes on forever. But you can see is um, the biggest thing over CDF you can see is the steps. So this is basically showing is that like if each step is equal size, that means basically this like just a new amount of count is being added on top. But if I look at something like, um, oops, if I look at the sum, you can see here is that it still goes up all the way to 100%, right? Because we counted everything. And it goes up to 12 this time. But you'll notice is that the steps are differently shaped. So you can see here, there's a very small step going up here. And what this is describing is that basically like we hit like four, it's that you can imagine like if we count four, three, two, one, you know, zero, about 30% of them, about 0.3 includes all of those values. Okay. And so when we go from like three to four, we jump up by a certain amount. And when we go up from like, you know, uh, zero to one, you see there's a very small jump. And then from one to two, a little smaller, bigger jump, but still pretty small. Versus going from like um, six to seven, you can see there's a bigger jump. You can see this bigger step going forward. And then you can see it's getting smaller and smaller. So on the very extreme part, you would actually see this get smoother and smoother um, because basically you have more just uh, like less discrete steps, more continuous. So this is again, like another way to describe the same information, but looking in it in a very different way. Does that make sense to people? Like how this relates to the data we already seen. Um, the biggest thing I'd say up here is just realizing again, like it's including everything that's underneath these values, which is why it's a cumulative. 
And the biggest way to kind of judge on like, you know, what this looks like is these steps. Like how big is this step forward? And you can see if it's uniform, right? If it was uh, uniformly distributed, the step sizes should be about equal. You can see there each step size is about equal versus something that's not uniform. In this case, um, what we usually see is for like a normal distribution, you can actually see the distribution step sizes changing. Okay, the size of the steps change as we go through the values. Okay. Cool. All right. So, um, uh, question. Yeah, so, so, mm -hmm. so, for the normal distribution, we will always expect this larger step in the middle, correct? Yeah, for a normal distribution, you'd have about that like largest step forward. Like most of your values are going to be right at that 50% mark. You know, it might be shifted left and right depending on like what values you're looking at, but you'd expect basically very small values at the extreme ends, so like at the beginning and at the end, and the largest steps happening near the middle. Yeah. Cool. Um, for the record, you can also pull up then like about what like this is a little harder because it's more discrete. But you could also pull up the median, right? It's at the 50% mark, where basically 50% of the values are beneath, 50% of the values are above. You just look at 50% here, go here. It's a little bit harder because it's like it's between six and seven. So like you have to realize like, oh, it's because it's integers. That's why it's going between there. So you probably just round it up and go to seven. Cool. All right. So our last distribution is a PDF. It's not the same thing as you're supposed to turn in for your project. Um, PDF being a probability distribution density function. And I think this is like the one that we most likely see because they're like PMFs, but they're continuous. So um, a good example of this, like right here, you can imagine that this in red here is in fact um, a PMF right here because the, the frequency, but instead of P, PDF basically fills in between those values right here. Now this is obviously, if you look at this closely, this is probably, this blue is not describing the red perfectly. It's probably an estimation. But the important part is basically, we could look at any value along the x-axis and find the frequency that would be for that x value or what we expect for that x value. So for the record, right, is that you actually can't ever know an exact number, right? You can't say like exactly for sure this frequency on a continuum. Um, and this is where I give the example of a target, right? So imagine I take like a dart. I'm, I'm right here. There we go. I take a little dart, hopefully you guys can see this because I know last time I tried it. And I want to say, you know, what's the probability of hitting, let's say, you know, like um, like this section right here. Like, like oh, okay, they split this in half. And what's the probability of hitting this section? And assuming I'm random and I can only hit the target, what would you probably say? It's a half, this should be 0.5. Yeah, 50%, right? If I'm completely random, I can only hit the target. Half the time I'm going to hit on the left, half the time I'm going to hit on the right, if I'm throwing completely random, right? OK, that makes sense. OK. Um, what's the chances of me hitting, like, let's say I have like this big old circle, and let's say I figure out the total area. And this total area is like um, one dip, OK? That would be the probability of hitting that one area, right? What's the probability of me hitting exactly right here? Would it be zero? Zero, yeah. So it is zero. Do you know? Do you know why? It's the real question, right? Because you so, have infinite points. I don't know what you'd be trying to hit. Yeah, that's 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 kind of like a good physical interpretation. It's also not just zero at the bullseye, but it's also zero to hitting exactly you know right here. And the way I kind of think about this physically is like I actually threw a dart or like you know shot an arrow and threw out this target. And the target's like, oh, did you hit exactly where I am? It's like, well, if I zoom in really close, like, ah, you're like off by like, you know, half a millimeter. It's like, oh, no, no, I'm even closer. Like you keep zooming in and eventually you can zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in until the point is assuming that you can do this infinitely. You'll never hit exactly that point. And that's the important part about a, um, a, uh, a PMF versus a PDE or PDF is that with a PMF, we already have discrete values. With a PMF, we don't usually talk about saying in one value, we talk about hitting a range. So we usually have to say, oh, within, but from between like this value and this value, same like in the target saying, oh, did you hit in this general area, and highlighting that area. So the subtle point, but it is important to kind of like realize that we do have to specify a range to get a um, probability. Okay. So know that you'll see that usually in your P, uh, PDF, say, oh, like the probability of hitting 
from here to here in this range is because you can't just say one value, otherwise it's exactly zero. All right. So one thing we also do with a P, uh, PMF, I mean PDF, but just also through the PDF, um, is that we normalize the area to one. So the reason why we do this area of one is the same idea with the range, is that if the PM, if the PDF does include all possibilities, right, then that means the probability of hitting anywhere in the possible range, let's say from zero to you know 100 is the possible score you can get, right? That area should add up to one because there's a 100% chance you'll hit between a value of zero and 100. Like there's, there's no other choice. And so that's why we normalize this area to over to one. So we call normalization. Um, and what's nice about this now is that if you normalize all this area to one, you can actually look at underneath the PDF's curve right here and say the area from let's say 12 to like 14 in this uh, description, you can just look at the area and that is literally your probability. So it's a really convenient way to basically do this. And what's cool is like, you're like, oh, find the area underneath the curve. We already know that we can do this. We can like, you can think like calculus, right? Like if you know what the description of this um, curve is, like mathematical description, you can find the area underneath it with like calculus or something. And we'll actually find that normal distributions actually make it really, really nice and do find this area. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay. All right. So this is where I kind of combine it all together. Um, I, I tried doing this myself and I was like, ah, oh, this is too much work. I'm trying to like make it like, and if I'm just Googling, it was a lot easier. So this is actually not my picture, but you get the point here is that we can actually combine all these together. Is that you can see here in this like pink normal right here, this is going to be like our, our histogram, which is like our PMF, right? You can see the PDF is this like smooth black curve right here. So it's kind of making an estimation of the overall like distribution. And then the blue here is actually our CDF, our cumulative distribution function. So you basically can put these all together and you can see this is, this, you know, this is kind of not true. Maybe like this pink is like um, a little more fuzzy, right? A little more messy. Um, but if you imagine like a little bit smoother, you can actually describe all the same information, but with three different ways of displaying it. And those three different ways are going to tell you different stories. And that's kind of like the idea of like why you would use a PDF versus a PMF versus CDF. Okay. Does that make sense to people? Everyone see like how this can tie all together here? Yeah. When would do you use one versus the other? Like really? Yeah. So that's a good question, right? So for me, Typically, like I think really well in like a PDF form. Is that I'm like, okay, like I can see the distribution in here. I have like essentially more of a smoother curve and I can see the area underneath this. Um, a CDF can be really useful when you really do want to think about more in the terms of like, well, I want to get at least this value. And so you can think of like, you know, when we look at this person, like, okay, I want to get at least one. I can go up to one, say, okay, that's going to hit. And I can actually have that value. It's like, okay, that's going to be like 0.9, like 90% 90, 90 of all my values are going to be at least one. Or sorry, uh, at most one. So that's kind of the idea that you can use your CDF for. Um, but a lot of times I'll think in PDF because that's it's easier. So Victor, uh, mm -hmm. it's just out of the context question. Uh, is the CDF is is a similar or same as a sigmoid? Or... Um, in this case, for a normal distribution, it's similar, um, but doesn't have to be. So. If anyone's familiar with a sigmoid curve, um, that's a different description. Um, it comes from the fact that the, the dis mathematical description for a histogram, an, uh, sorry, a histogram, a normal distribution, also Gaussian, um, when you do the area underneath the curve, it turns out to be very similar, if not exactly, I'd have to check the math, exactly to the sigmoid equation. Um, but you don't have to have a normal distribution. So your CDF does not have to be the same exact shape. So you might see something a little more, um, like you could actually have something like, it's always gonna go up, but you might have like sudden jumps in your CDF. Um, this one's a nice smooth one because most values are gonna be found in the middle. So you get most of this value upwards and you can see that kind of flattens out because most value, like there's very few values on the tails over here. Yeah, good question, yeah. It is this look like a sigma window for anyone who's familiar. Cool. Um, Keep on moving on, sound pretty good. Any other questions? Yeah. All right, so um, one thing to note is that like actually creating this PDF, like this is really smooth, but in reality, no data is actually like continuous, it's always discrete, right? You will never have true continuous data. It's just 
not a real possibility, even if you're talking about things that should be continuous. Um, so like, how do you actually get this? So I wanted to kind of put this a little bit. It's like one way to do this is through a parametric fit. And parametric, you're like, oh, that sounds like a fancy word. Like, what is parametric? Think parameter. Basically, there are parameters that we can pass into the value and say, oh, we believe that this, for example, these this data should be a normal curve, a normal distribution. Then it's like, okay, like what do what describes a normal distribution? And we find that the thing that describe a normal distribution basically is just two things: the average and the standard deviation. And once you know those two things, you can create a normal distribution however you want. And that would be a parametric fit. If you know your data is supposed to fit into a different kind of distribution, let's say for example, um, you have kind of thing one that we actually talked about, um, like a binomial distribution. We can actually say, oh, okay, well, it's going to be a binomial distribution because this is the theory behind it. So we can actually pass in the values for that equation and match it with our data. Um, so note that the parametric fit is not going to be perfect because you can see here there's a bunch of spikes right here, and this might be putting in, the, for example, the average is like zero and the standard deviation is like I don't know, like 0.5. Um, that this is not going to be perfectly matching up the data, but it might estimate the data to close to what we expect it to be. The other way to do this, to get more of a natural curve, which we kind of saw a little bit in like a violin plot, is something called the kernel density function or KDF or kernel density estimation. So you see KDE. Okay. So the way you do this, and this is where like, I, like forgive me if like I'm like, um, this feels very complicated, but I think it's kind of important to know like what's happening here is that if you imagine on the left here, this is your actual data. This is like your histogram. And in fact, here um, in this diagram, these points, I'm going to highlight it in, ooh, let's try it, just, just do red. These points right here are the true data points. Okay, so this is the actual data measured. Okay. And hopefully that makes sense in like where are we getting this histo histogram, right? Or I shouldn't say histogram, I should say your, your PNF. We see the density, right? So you can see here's like, okay, like this value right here, let's just say it's like, oh, that's like, I'm just gonna make that numbers. Like this is one, this is like two, and this is like three. Or say negative three, negative two, negative one. Okay. And it's like, oh, this is like positive two, and this is like five, and this is like six. Okay, like that's my actual data. I can put this in a histogram. And what I want is this nice, beautiful little like organic looking curve to estimate this. Like you can see, hopefully you guys can see that um, how these are similar to each other, right? You can see like this, um, it's not maybe super obvious here, but like if I fill this in, right? There's a big gap in between here. So you can kind of see it's like, oh, it's kind of like that bimodal where most values are right here. And then there's some like a little bit of a spike over here. Okay. But maybe if you do this over time, we get closer and closer to this value. Um, the way you build up this blue guy right here from the data points that you found down here is essentially you say, okay, let me just take this value and I'm, I'm gonna kind of skip like why you do this for a second, but what you do is take this value and say, okay, let me make a normal distribution, like a little, more, little normal distribution centered exactly at this point. So what that would look like is something like this. Okay, and that's what this like, you know, this little graph right here, it's kind of hard to see with the dotted lines, but you can see that's our red line. That's basically, it's our normal distribution centered right there. And then we do, I'm sorry, it's actually the wrong one. This is, should be on the far left right here. This far left point should be this curve right here. You guys see that? It's how it's centered right there. And then we do that for every single data point. Okay, and that's why you see all of those um, diagrams or like these little, tiny little normal curves. Okay, then what we do, we essentially like, um, if anyone's in like wave mechanics in like physics, when two waves come together, do you guys know what happens then? They like add up together to make like a bigger wave. Okay, that's kind of what's going on here. It's basically these three waves together. If all their um, like their their crest at the top at like is close together, those will add up to be a bigger crest. And then the parts that are like you know you see here like oh here's a big crest right here, but then you can see like there's like these like kind of like small parts right here. This will subtract overall. And you can see like these two will add up together, but not as strong as these three together. And so the, and essentially what you do, you add up these like waves essentially, and note that these normal distributions go up to infinity in both directions. So you can basically create this blue guy, this uh, kernel density estimation um, to go up to infinity. Does that makes sense. Like once they say like, oh, how this is built, like how you get from these like little data points to like this blue guy right here. I get it, but like, when would it be appropriate to use something like that? 
Yeah. So the thing is, is like when you expect that, like you, if you were to say this is a normal distribution, you probably would get a normal distribution that would look kind of like I'm making something up here, but like would look something like this. When you look at that, you're like, that's not really like, that's not what my data look like. You know, like this is not, this is and this is like an estimation. This is more parametric and like that doesn't really fit with like what I expect my data is. Um, a kernel density estimation allows my data to like, like actually building up a PDF actually built on my data versus something that's like, oh, I think the data should look like this. So I'm going to force it into this equation where like, like I said, like if I did a normal distribution, wouldn't look great. And so what's kind of cool is that this actually has a mathematical equation that you can build out from. Um, this is just with dynamics, but basically this creates now something you can calculate with. And now you don't have this, this histogram. You can actually calculate like, it's like, okay, what's the probability of hitting between here and here? which in this value, we might not actually have that data point, but if you imagine like, oh, we were to keep redoing it and it kept the same pattern, we'd probably get something that's close to this blue um, kernel density estimation. Makes sense. Yep. Okay, yeah. So this is very common where people use a KDE. Um, yes, I saw it a lot on the Seaborn charts mm -hmm. as options. Yeah, exactly. But would it be Seaborn. appropriate to say something like this? Like, um, so mm -hmm. I have five, you know, we have five measurements on the left. Mm -hmm. And clearly, they're not a uh, normal distribution um, in the in the way that they're currently looking, um, and it's a sample. Um, so we don't think it's going to be a normal distribution in the end. If we had more observations to kind of get up to, let's say we had 100 or 200 observations to put onto this chart, but we take the observations we do have, which is only five, and we build, you know, some curves, standard curves around each of those points, and add and then add them. So we're kind of allowing for some variation around the points that we already know. That's right. It really is data focus where you're like, oh, this is what this is what my data are saying. So I'm gonna build a function built around that data versus saying the opposite is like having the theory. It's like, I think it should be this equation, which is like a normal distribution and trying to fit my data onto that normal distribution, right. which might not be true. Um, so. Yeah, that's in this description, you for the record, you guys probably will never have to do this exact like calculation, like figuring this part out. Um, this is usually like a KDE like option, like for example, Seaborn uh, will actually calculate this for you. Uh, you don't have to do it yourself. It's really easy. Um, and for the record, like this is where I go, like, like, why did we like why does this work? Like, why is this normal distribution? Like, why am I putting normal like mini normal distribution and adding them all together? It's because in some ways, what we're saying in this situation, it's like, hey. I measured the data here, but it's possible if I reran this um, data, I might find values right here or values even here, you know? But like, I probably will still find a lot of values near the point that I measured. So that's gonna look like a normal distribution. And then we do that for every point. So that's essentially what we're doing. Basically trying to rerun multiple experiments. We're like pretending as if we did do this many, many, many times, this would be likely what we'd expect this to look like. So that's kind of what's going on with the kernel density estimation. Um, once you realize that too, you realize that you can also be non-normal distribution, but there's actually a few reasons why we expect it to normally, like when we measure it over and over again, we would expect a normal distribution. And that's gonna be the central limit theorem. Yeah, that's the that's the logic of this kernel density estimation. Or density function. I know that got kind of technical and like, um, to be honest, like if you never remember this part, you'd probably be okay. But I think it helps a little bit to understand like where that's coming from. Um, just to show you a little distribution, like a comparison, you can see here the parametric fit is like the normal distribution. You can see here's my actual data. Like it's roughly normal, but like you can see it's not quite, there's a little flat right here. And that's where the kernel destiny estimation actually has a really good job of actually capturing this. Because like, you know, it's not quite normal, it's close, but it's more like fat on top, like more of a flat top here. Um, so this kind of capturing that um, essence in there. It does make it a little more complicated, but it still holds true with your data. Okay. Oh, not pretty good. All right. I want to show that kernel density estimation because it does come up a lot in people. Like you, you see it and you're just like, I don't know what this is doing, and but that's what's happening. All right. So cool. That kind of like does like a whole bunch of like you know describing data. Now I keep talking about this normal distribution and like okay, this like. What is this normal distribution? What is it good for? How we define it? So um, I have like a little crush on like the normal distribution, but just for the record. Like you can see this bell curve, normal distribution, Gaussian. It's just a it's just a nice like 
really great distribution. It happens all the time in most things we do. We'll see that in central limit theorem. Um, and like, this is the actual equation of uh, Gaussian normal distribution. Um, they're the same thing. Um, and it looks very complicated. Like, oh my gosh, like there's so many different values going on through here. But what's kind of nice is that this, you know, um, this square root of two pi, that's just a number. Two, also a number. E is just the um, Euler's number. So 2.718 right? Getting on forever. Um, so there's a bunch of values here. And then you can see here, um, we have X and Y. So the idea here is that if we put in a value for X, we would calculate all this stuff and we'd get a value for Y. And that would tell us how high it goes up on that value. So if I say, oh, X at you know, 160 and put this value in for this um, equation, I get a Y value that would tell me how high that value should be. And that's what that blue curve is going on here. And it's like, okay, like how do we adjust this? The only two things we change are the mean, which is mu here, and the standard deviation sigma. And you can see here, sigma, sigma here, and we plug those in and that's specific to our data, to our observations. And now we get a magical uh, normal distribution. So this is what's nice and what's really nice about it. And now we actually can do some really great math with this. Um, which is why the motivation of like why we try to get to here. And what's doubly cool is that this turns out to be really useful because most data actually ends up being into a normal distribution. So we can actually use the central limit theorem to actually get this um, into this form and then actually do some math on it. Makes sense? Hopefully that makes sense for like where this equation is coming from into here. Um, you don't have to worry about like how do you build up this equation? Don't worry too much about this. In fact, if you probably never saw this equation again, you'd probably be okay too. But the important thing to note is that there is an equation for this bell curve, and all you have to do is basically pass in the standard deviation mean, and that could give you any normal distribution or any variation of um, the Gaussian. Yeah. Cool. Sound good? All right. So what, what I'm talking about this cool math, right? So once you could actually take you know, the value underneath this curve, you can actually take the, you know, back so let's take the integral of this curve over certain x values. Um, but it's nice because it's a normal distribution. We actually can very quickly describe what the 68, 95, 99 rule. I don't know if it, has anyone heard of this rule before by chance, like come through. So it's not a couple thumbs up. Good. Um, what's kind of cool about that is that you can quickly look at a normal distribution and the let's just say the data and expect within one standard deviation from left and right, 68% of the values to fall within that um, area. And basically so that means if you took, you know, the integral of this equation going from you know uh, negative sigma to positive sigma, you would get um, 0.68. So that's essentially what's going on here. Um, with two standard deviations from left and right, you get you capture ninety five percent of all the values, and then three standard deviations we capture all of those values in there. Okay, so that means like values that are beyond three standard deviations only occur like less than like you know like outside of this range, like less than 03 percent of the time, at least in a normal distribution. So that's kind of the idea of um, what we're doing now. We will use a normal distribution of Gaussians for hypothesis testing. Um, but I don't know if anyone, um, like I, I came from like physics. So like, this is like the part that I remember, I remember a lot um, is that there's certain like to say like uh, we do an experiment and we say like, oh, like we got this value and this value is so many standard deviations away from our expected value. Um, we usually say, hey, that means like this normal distribution that we had because it's so far off to the right here that it's probably not the right it's not probably not the right idea. This is probably not the full picture. There's probably a different distribution, or I should say, a different normal distribution that we should have used instead. And that's when we say we make a discovery. Um, I don't know if anyone's like heard this, like, you know, if it's from science, like you can standard deviations. Um, so that usually what we'll say is like, oh, if it's so many standard deviations away from our expected value, we say, oh, that's, we're not accounting for something. Or usually that means like, oh, we made a discovery or, you know, like, oh, we found out this, you know, um, for doctors, this drug worked. So, for the record, does anyone know how many standard deviations um, you need for like what we say like for particle physics? Like this is really like niche, but like how many standard deviations they're looking for to say like we think there's something there versus like a discovery? I think it was a five or six, right? Yeah, five five sigma five standard deviations um, means that you know like it's like oh there's probably something there. Seven sigma is required for uh, the particle physics like what we're like right now at least seven standard deviations. To say there's an actual discovery that's like legitimate in the sense that like oh there's almost no chance for that being a chance and you can imagine how small that decimal is like the percent chance of that happening is very very small um does anyone know what it is generally in the medical community like what you, what kind of standard deviation you're looking for to say like oh this drug actually works i guess three i'd say one 
yeah, one, some, some, sometimes there is something, um, but it's usually around two and three, like three is like, oh, three is amazing. Like, like, oh my gosh, it's huge. And like, this is definite, but you can see like, like there's still a 0.3% chance that could have like could occur outside there. Obviously the part of the reason why is because to get that many people to actually be sure to get like a three, that's a three Sigma is still really hard. And plus people are very different from each other. They're not as, um, there's so many other conflicting factors that to get past the three standard deviations, basically to never approve a drug ever. Um, so it's kind of an interesting story there. But we'll actually do that when we talk about hypothesis settings. Like, you know, how many standard deviations do you need to actually approve, like not approve, but like we can, what we call reject the null hypothesis, basically saying, oh, it's not just random chance. There is something actually going on here. And that's what hypothesis testing, A-B testing would be about. Uh, um, I'm not gonna go into details here, but like what that is, is called the Z-score. And the Z-score, like, don't worry about like this, don't worry about this guy right here, we're gonna talk about in the future. All the Z-score tell you is basically how many standard deviations are you from the mean in a normal distribution? That's all it means. Um, it's like how many standard deviations you are from the mean, um, and that's the Z-score. So you can very quickly figure out like, oh, okay, like if I'm the Z-score of three, that means I'm three standard deviations away from the mean, at least in the distribution. And we'll touch this again. Any questions kind of so far? Um, we got about 20 more minutes of study group. I just, I think I have a couple more things. I'm probably not gonna get to this guy, um, but I wanna make sure if anyone has any questions or lingering thoughts, they can ask them now. Okay, so um, I have a little interactive Gaussian series, which I find super fun. I don't know. I, I find things, some weird things that are fun. Um, so right here on the left here is this uh, standard, like this little nice normal distribution. Um, I'll say normal distribution, Gaussian, just interchangeably, just now they're basically the same thing. Um, and this is actually really cool is that you can adjust here the average and adjust like, for example, this case, the standard deviation. So you can see here is that this would be a standard deviation or a mean of zero right here. So centered on zero and then standard deviation of about one. So you can see here, like, okay, we can see these values. And what's cool about this is that you can actually see that they have x um, one equals one, I mean, one standard deviation. That's what those red lines are. You can see here, I can show my z-score calculation, which you can see it's about one, because basically I'm just one away. Um, and then the probability is saying, what's the probability in here? So based on like what we've learned already, on one standard deviation from the mean on both sides, what should be the overall probability to be in this area? 68. 68 from the 68, 95, 97 rule, right? You can see here, it's about 68. Yeah, that's what we'd expect. Um, if I did two standard deviations, as you might guess, it's about 60, or it's not 60, um, about 95%. Okay, so you can see like a little bit of this. And what's kind of cool is you can also see like, well, what happens if I move my um, average over? So if I'm just moving my average, you can see it's the same thing. It's just being moved over. Instead of being centered at zero, it might be centered over at like a five. So for example, it's very unlikely for you to have like a negative height, but maybe for example, let's say like, you know, you're really tall, like uh, three meters, something like that. Um, let's say closer to like, you know, like, oh, it's like one and a half meters, almost two meters. I'll just say the average is two meters, so you know, that's not true. But you can see it's like, oh, we could go in this general direction. The normal distribution does go far off to the left, far off to the right. Maybe the standard deviation is a little bit uh, tighter, so a smaller standard deviation. We see most of the values now are very, very close to the average, which makes sense. Most people are not, you know, nine meter, uh, not nine meters, three meters was about nine feet. Like that's pretty high. In fact, to be like, let's say, let's say with a standard deviation of like point, uh, point 0.4 um, mu of two, and I move this guy, let's just wait off to infinity. So anyone taller than like nine feet, right? At least from this little model, this would be a chance to be like, what's this 0. 0.0071. So this is like, 0.7% um, of the population, which is probably even stu still too high for a normal distribution. Um, and that's also assuming, of course, like the average is six feet, which is definitely not true, um, at least worldwide. So you can see a little bit kind of playing around with it. I, I like this little um, this little uh, interactive um, guy because you can kind of really see a little bit like, oh, if the standard deviation is very large, you can see what that changes. You can kind of see a little bit like, you know, moving this doesn't really change anything, just basically how you count those values from like the average and whatnot. Well, a little treat in there, um, you can play around with. So some quick stuff that we have um, before we kind of, oh, we get like one more minutes, like I said, um, so we're pretty good, is uh, a few things about deviations from a normal distribution. So we can have skewness. So we can have something that's like a nice symmetric normal distribution, but then you can have skewness. So I think this is where it's the most confusing. So it's like, what direction you skew? 
the skew is basically like you can imagine like where the tail is being pulled towards. So you can see here in this case, it's positively skewed, it's skewed towards the positive side. The skewness is kind of like where the tail is getting pulled extra. Okay. So you can see that if I pull that tail farther to the right, right, from like on this um compared to like uh, this normal distribution, you can see the mean is going to get pulled too. But the median is probably not going to change too drastically because the median tends to be more robust than the mean, as we saw. Same thing for negative skew or left skew. Basically, the values are getting pulled off to the left here. And so you see the mean kind of go off to the left. So this is what we talk about for skewness. Um, there, this is where usually people ask me, you know, like for example, we have standard deviation. We saw what um, sigma is used to calculate standard deviation. Skewness can also be calculated, but it becomes a little more, little more difficult because standard deviation is not like inherent. It's just one way of measuring spread. It's just a very good way of measuring spread. You can also formally calculate skewness. And um, I'll let you guys, you know, look that up, you know, search um, what skewness looks like for the equation. But if you look at it, it's very similar to standard deviation, but to a next power. Basically, it's like, you know, essentially saying, how does your standard deviation skew, like move, if that makes sense, like the spread of your standard deviation, that's kind of what's going on. Um, and that describes skewness. So it's kind of like, if you imagine like standard deviation being the squared, right, your skewness is kind of like to the power of three. So you'll see equations kind of similar to that. So you can check that out. Um, kurtosis is kind of like skewness, um, but like a little more subtle is that um, this was actually a little uh, thing done by a, a, um, a, a statistician, data scientist. Uh, I thought it was funny. But like, you can think of kurtosis as being so like how like steep, you know, like your peak is. So um, you can imagine like a higher kurtosis basically means you have fatter tails or a smaller tails. So you can imagine like if you had a normal distribution, maybe it looked like closer, like, like this, high kurtosis would look like this where now the tails have been like squeezed in where you have thinner tails. Um, if you have lower kurtosis, you might actually have fatter tails, call it like fatter tails. And you can see on this general like spread over here and you can see like you just have, you're more likely to get these more extreme values. And this can also be measured. It's kind of similar to the sense of how we measure standard deviation. You can kind of imagine this being like to the power of four if standard deviation is like the power of two and skewness is the power of three. So it's kind of like, it's, it's like, don't like think like, like, oh, I just raised the power of four or something like that. But it's kind of like, you can kind of imagine like it's measuring like how much that's changing. But that's what kurtosis is. Um, there's a bunch of ways to measure kurtosis as well. Um, again, there's not like, it's just a description. It's not like a form of like, oh, kurtosis is this specific thing, you know, and this is the only way to measure it. So there's just like correlation. There's a few ways to measure correlation. Um, it's just a lot of very common ones. All right, so that ends this notebook here, which is this, the intro to statistical distributions. Um, but uh, I'll kind of like pause here for a second. Um, does anyone have any questions about anything we talked about? Anything we going through? Um, all this good stuff, which is our PDF, our PMF, our CDF, normal distribution, randomness, a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, Vector, we can find mm -hmm. this notebook in your repo. That's right. Yeah. So um, this repo in this case, like most of the stuff that we'll have for uh, section or phase two should be in probability and stats. Uh, in this case, we're, the first part that we did statistical distribution or statistic basics is in here. So it's like semi statistics. And then statistical distributions. This will be spit, like you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff. We only we did uh, we did this massive um, notebook, which is the statistical distributions intro. OK, thank you. No problem. Um, oops, intro. So let's hear. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this. So I don't want to make you guys panic though. Oh no, <laughs> it's going to go into another hour of statistical distributions. Uh, but I kind of want to briefly just show you like what we'll briefly talk about next time. Um, at least my hope is kind of relatively brief compared to like an hour and a half. Um, there's some other distributions we can talk about that are statistical distributions. And so we talk about the normal distribution and talk about the mean and standard deviation. And we'll talk things like binomial distribution. Um, and then also like some other distributions like uniform, negative, geometric, binomial, and all that stuff. Um, I think, let's see here, let me make sure I have a notebook available. Yep, uh, we'll talk about these as well. And just know that basically like these are all different equations and there's different situations where this distribution makes sense. The reason why you might use this is for two different reasons, two main reasons. One is that 
you actually have the equation here and you want to simulate something that you know, know would be in a normal distribution or whatever statistical distribution. So you want to um, simulate that. You can use an equation to simulate what that would look like and actually do some mathematics without ever getting real data. So simulating data. Um, two is actually you have data already and you want to do a parametric fit on that data. So we kind of talked a little bit like um, a KDE versus um, a parametric fit. A KDE, you're basically using the data focus first and like basically building out a distribution from the data. A parametric fit is where we already have like essentially a theory of where this um, data should come from. And so we're basically going to fill this in from the data and basically make a nice, neat mathematical equation from it. Um, that can be really useful because, you know, KDEs can be really nice, but also like sometimes if we know certain attributes of like these distributions, we can use those attributes um, and say, well, the data is close enough to a normal distribution. And if it's close enough to a normal distribution, we can calculate all these amazing things from it, um, which is the motivation of why we would actually use a distribution that's like, uh, like we'd use a parametric fit. So we'll talk more about these um, these sections here. Um, I'll probably not, to be honest, I probably will try not to like, I'll strive not to like focus too much on this because it's a lot to go through um, and not all in the curriculum is in there. Sometimes it's, some of this material is also in the appendix, but I think it's useful to know just to see what different distributions are out there. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, unless there's any questions, I can stop the recording here. So any questions before I stop? Okay, stop it here.